everyone on this beautiful Sunday cooler morning. We, we definitely welcomed to the cooler weather, didn't we? <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, it's been a long week for some kids, I'm sure. But for me, it was a quick week. I don't know how it was for you, but it was a very fast week for me. So all the kids, I think, did well, and we're glad they did their projects. And it's just a good learning experience for those kids. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, please be with council this week as they meet. Also, continue to pray for our search committee um, and those who are on that who will be helping us on our journey to a new pastor. 
Oh, one thing I wanted to highlight is, um, and just give you a little snippet, Breaching Team is planning some very special things and um, spicing up some things. So we will be giving you snippets of that coming here really soon. We're very excited about our Wednesday evening programs. So we'll just look forward to that. And please pray for Reaching Team. Uh, up and coming to mark your calendar, if you were on Search Team, August 10th, there will be a council meeting with the search team at 6.30 p.m. So just mark your calendar now for that meeting. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Psalm 66, 1 through 4. Oh, 
Indeed, how great is our God. Our God is awesome, and we serve an awesome God. Uh, what do you know? You know, Pastor Dave is, is retired now, and so for the next bunch of Sundays, until we, we find a new pastor for our church, we're going to have what we call guest pastor, pastor. Do you know what a guest is? Can somebody help me out? What's a guest? Kenton? Exactly. Somebody who visits us and, and that person is going to preach. Um, this is a hard one. Guess who's the, the, the guest pastor this morning? You know, Pastor Dave, he used to get down on the floor and sit with you guys and I can just barely cross my legs, but I'll try it. Today, oh, I can't cross my legs. Today, we're going to talk about how awesome God is. You know what awesome means? It means great. We just sang a song about how great is our God. What things that he's done are awesome. And um, I better watch out before I pull this off. What's some things that you know that make God awesome? Addie, you, you got one for me? Come on, I know you do. Yes, you do. Nothing? Do you have a garden at home? Do you have a dog at home? Oh, is your dog cute? Yeah? Who created your dog? God. Is that awesome? Mm-hmm. Kenton, you got any awesome stuff that God does? You got to. Think hard. Think harder. How about um, when you when you wake up in the morning? What what's coming up in the sky? Over, I hope I got it right. That way, it's round and yellow. Hmm. What is that? Hmm. Comes up. It goes round. What is it? Come on, we're going to go. You're going to make me go too long here. I'm going to get in trouble. The sunrise. Isn't that awesome? Some, some mornings, aren't the sunrise? It's pretty. It's red in the sky all along the clouds. Sure. Uh-huh. Were any of you born? Mm, now that's a tough one. Yeah, all three of you? Whoa, now that's awesome. You came, you big guys came, little tiny guys out of mom's belly. Wow, isn't that awesome? And who did that? Did God help do that? The Bible says God knit us in our mother's womb. That, means it's part of her belly is a womb. God did that. It's awesome. So watch around. You know, if you see a pretty butterfly or, or um, a beautiful flower. Yes, ma'am, do you have a question? Hmm? Yes? What is it? You're right. Yeah, God makes us grow. He stopped me at 5'11 and three quarters. I wanted to be six foot tall and 
I never got there. Now I'm shrinking. So that's right. And that's a, that's a pretty good miracle, especially when you start out about this big and you have tiny little hands and little feet, little bitty nose, and look at you today. And you're going to keep growing and keep growing until you're maybe five foot six or you six foot two and Nolan, you're going to be maybe six ten. Whoa, yeah, all right. So look around you every day. You'll see things that show you that God is awesome, okay? I'm not going to ask you to rise, but just stay in your seats, and as you sing the song, sing it to the Lord.
Dear Heavenly Father, um, we do indeed want to see you, to see you, you face to face. And we know, Lord, that that day is coming when you call us home. But in the meantime, Lord, help us to see you in everything around us, in the creation that you've placed us in, in all the individuals in your family, Lord. Um, we are all part of your family and all part of you. And help each one of us to show others who you are through how we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Carol, I, I, I hope that I didn't um, disappoint you too much. You asked me last week, Sunday, you couldn't wait to see how I was going to be, and I'm not dressed up like anybody strange this time. But I am dressed up like the person who I'm going to be. I am dressed up as myself. Today I'm going to, to go through things in my life that, um, that prove the awesomeness of God. And um, the Preebies aren't here this morning, and I, I thought they had a, a mailbox out there to help me out for her first name, and it's not there. What is her first name? Michelle. Michelle, when I, um, I came across this verse, made this shirt for me. And um, if you can't see it up there, you can follow by looking at my back here. The verse says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, that verse has, um, has helped me through the past couple years now um, with my cancer and especially with my depression. But I said we're going to talk about we serve an awesome God. And, um, you know, today, awesome, the word awesome is really overused. I don't know about you, but there's so many commercials on TV that claim that their product is awesome. Or um, if you've been watching the, the Olympics, I don't know, I haven't caught any one of the announcers explain the... the um, performance of, of the athletes as awesome, but awesome is, um, is just a word that can do and mean anything. You can, you can call a, a good meal you had at the restaurant awesome. Um, Spencer, our former drummer, in my opinion, if I was going to use the word awesome, but I shouldn't, has an awesome car. He's got a Mustang. Nancy and I had a Mustang. When we were first married, it was a 66. I wish I had it today. Um, it was a neat car. I won't call it awesome. Um, but I went to the dictionary to help me find what awesome means. And one of the very interesting things that I found was a graph, a graph of the use of the word awesome. Now, I, I, I'm not, I, I haven't reached Pastor Dave's little ability with a clicker to get a, a, that graph on there, but I'll, I'll do it with my hand here. Starting over here is 1800 and ending over here is 2019. And it goes through 2000, 1800, 1850, 1900, 1950, and 2019. So it starts out over here down at the bottom of the graph. And it stays there, 2000, 1850, 2000, 1900, I'll, I'll, I'll get it. It's right on my paper here. Then, it, then it, it, for some reason, and it's hard to explain, but around 1950, 
Now bear in mind, I was born in 1952. I have no idea if that's the reason why it started to go up. But it started to go up there, then it, it took a climb, and then it took a downward climb. But now in 2019, it was way up here. So like I said, it's being overused for more than what it deserves. Um, but the dictionary says um, that Awesome means causing or inducing awe, inspiring an overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration, or fear. And um, they gave an example, um, and of course this is the world, in the awesome power of the atomic bomb. Now isn't that just great? Or another definition is filled with awe. Well. What does awe mean? I, I needed to go there next. Awe means a feel, feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder. So today we want to talk about how awesome God is. And um, I like to, to think of God's awesomeness um, one way is, is through creation, through nature. And, and Jimmy's going to help me out here and put a couple slides up. And um, there's a, a picture of a, an awesome bird. It's called a snowy owl. It spends most of its time way up north. And in the wintertime, if things are tough up there for food, it comes south and it'll be here. That was taken on a light uh, stand at the airport here in Goshen. What's the next one? Oh, this, if you don't think God is not awesome, this is a purple gallinule. It has, it, it, God had fun painting that bird, I'm sure. It, there's some colors you can't even see in that picture. What's the next one, Jimmy? Oh, I talked about it with the kids. This is a sunset. We don't see the sun, but we see the unbelievable redness that caused by the sunset. And there's another sunset going down that, that red and you know what I think is so cool about a sunset? If you, if you concentrate on it, you can almost see the sun dropping below the horizon, and I think that's so cool. What else you got for us? Ah, this one. Can anybody, can you see what that is? In the clouds is a shadow of the plane that I was on going to the Dominican Republic. Now, there's no one, no one, no one, no one on earth that can make that happen except God. And that was, I, I couldn't believe what I saw. I had to take a picture. There's our plane weighing up there, but there's the plane itself. Is, is that it, Jimmy? Oh, yes, we have more. That's, I don't know the name of that moth, but it is, it was snow white except for those, um, the purple color around the wings and the two little yellow antennae. And here's another moth that somehow, by going on the screen, got stretched out a little bit. But it, the color, and if you look closely, God put two huge fake eyes on that thing to keep predators away. Now, if that's not awesome, I don't know what is. <laughs> this came out of our garden. Just like that. Smiley face tomato. Now, come on, you tell me. That just happened? Uh-uh. And I think that's, that's it. Okay, smiley face goodbye. Is God awesome or what? Well, in my life, I, I begin the, the awesomeness of God um, prior to when I was born. God took two one-cell things, brought them together in my mother's womb, and as the psalm says, knit me in my mom's womb, and I was born. I was, I was there for the birth, but I don't remember a thing. I don't even remember the doctor swatting me on the butt so I'd start crying and breathe. But I know it happened because um, I'm here. And it's been told to me that's how it works. And I didn't get to see our four boys born, so um, I do know some of it. 
But that's the first miracle that I account in my life. And if, if that isn't awesome, if, if, if that's just something that, that happened, I, I can't understand how people, how doctors, how scientists can say that, that my embryo, when it came together, was not a human being. If it wasn't, why am I a human being today? That's miracle number one. Well, then my, my life uh, will take a quick jump to fourth grade. Fourth grade, I, I had rheumatic fever. Now, I don't know if you're aware of what rheumatic fever. It's, um, it's a disease that affects the muscles and the, knee, and, and the joints in your body. And at that time, and I haven't kept up with it, but at, in, in fourth grade that year, whatever year that was, they had no idea what caused it. They only knew that it followed um, strep throat. Um, but it, it was painful. I, I, to walk, to get from my mom's and dad's bedroom where I had to stay to the bathroom, I had to put both hands against the hallway to get to the bathroom because my knees and my, my ankles hurt so much. Um, I always thought it was four weeks, but mom corrected me. It was eight weeks that I spent in bed with that first bout of rheumatic fever. But God cured me of that. What I didn't know until we were married, when my mom gave me my medical records, I did not know that my parents went through a scare that they didn't need to go through. Um, my mom had a friend who was a nurse, and she felt that the symptoms that I had were symptoms for leukemia. And so I had to go and have blood tests taken. Um, and I remember the blood test because, for one, when we got to the doctor's office, my dad opened my door and carried me, a fourth grader, into the doctor's office. Now, I just at the time thought that he carried me because I couldn't walk. But I know now he carried me because he was carrying his son, who may have leukemia. And at that time, I don't know how much of a cure there was for leukemia. But praise God, after they took as much blood as they could out of this arm, and then they went to this arm and took as much, they determined I didn't have leukemia. And I, I got through that first bout of rheumatic fever. Well, then in seventh grade, wouldn't you know, I got rheumatic fever again. And this time I know it was eight weeks. And um, same thing, I was in bed for eight weeks. I couldn't get out of bed other than to, to, to bathe and to use the bathroom. But in both, both times, both times, I, I forgot the first time, both times what God provided for me for help was the neighbor boy next door. He's a year older than I am. He's actually my brother John's age. But every day, I would sit at the window. My parents took a bed from upstairs, put it in their bedroom. Now, think about it. Your kid is in your bedroom for eight weeks. Not much privacy there. And you're going to have to put up with that. I don't, man, I don't know how they did it. But I'd sit at the window and watch for Bill to come home from school every day. And when he came home, he would wave at me, I'd wave at him. He'd go in the house and change and then came over to our house and spent the rest of the afternoon with me for 16 weeks total. Now that's a good friend and that was a blessing from God, a miracle. We could have had neighbors next door that didn't have any children and I wouldn't have had that blessing. He was the best man in our wedding, um, just a great friend. Um, one of the things that rheumatic fever attacks, since it's a muscle, is your heart. Your heart over here. And um, I had a heart murmur after the second time of rheumatic fever. And I don't know. I was going to look it up. I forgot to Google it. I don't know if, rheumatic, if, heart, if heart murmurs normally go away. But when I got into high school, I think my senior or junior year, I was tested, my heart murmur was gone. Now that is a miracle. 
and my heart has been strong ever since. My heart could have been damaged enough that I would have to be worried about heart problems, and I don't need to worry about that. Now, that was a miracle from God. Well, then the next miracle that, that came into my life was um, a family named the Leos, who dad worked in Chicago for AT&T, and he was being transferred on his job. Now, AT&T could have transferred him anywhere in the country, anywhere, because AT&T was all over the country. But God transferred him to New York City. And God transferred their family to right around the corner from ours. And um, wouldn't you know it, Nancy was their oldest daughter. And I got to meet Nancy being our neighbor. And um, I've said it many times to lots of people, but Nancy is the best gift that God has ever given me, second only to the gift of, gift of salvation from Jesus. Couldn't believe it. She came to my sister's graduation party. I didn't know her. My sister and my brother walked to school with her. I was in college, and um, I think it was love at first sight, for sure. And here we are. We just celebrated last week 47 years of marriage. What a blessing from God, and um, another miracle. God could have sent them to California, and we wouldn't, I wouldn't even be here today if that was the case because the reason we're here is another miracle. We had to go visit relatives in Chicago for a wedding and we visited Shipshawana because we had Nancy had seen an advertisement in our paper in the winter time. We were going to go on Wednesday to see the animal auction, but her aunt knew Shipshawana real well. And her aunt said, no, you don't, you don't, like the little kids, you don't want to go to the, they're going to be bored. Go on Tuesday. So we went on Tuesday and we came through Goshen, through uh, east on State Road 4 and turned north on State Road 13. But at that intersection is an Amish house. And at that Amish house, the Amish man was doing carpenter work on the house on old wooden rickety ladders and scaffolds that, I just said to Nance, that would look like an interesting place to visit. And um, this is part of the miracle. Nance said, well, let, let's do it. I didn't expect her to say that, but we did. We turned around, pulled down their driveway. We introduced ourselves, and for the next hour, David P. Yoder showed us all around the farm. The boys were having a great time with their boys, and uh, we got they got to see workhorses and cows and I think a bull and Craig was just little and their little guy was just little and they both played in the sandbox together. Craig spoke English and he spoke Dutch but they both knew how to operate those those toys in the sandbox. Um, and then we proceeded on, oh I said to him I always wanted to see an Amish barn raising and um, he said there's one tomorrow in Topeka and I said do you think the farmer would mind if if I went and watched, or maybe, hell, oh, I don't think he would mind. So we went off to the flea market. I never asked for directions of where Topeka was even. I had no idea. We got done at the flea market, and we're on our way back north to go back to Chicago. And we got up to the traffic light at the corner uh, in Shipshawana where the, the um, craft store is, craft barn. And Nan said, I, oh, I'd really like to go in there yet. So I said, all right, I'll wait with the kids in the car. And as I waited in the car, I just said, I'm going to kick myself if I don't get directions to that barn raising. So all of you know, I think, of what I had to do, what we had to do. We were in Shipshawana. We had to drive all the way around to Middlebury, then drive all the way back but south to Shipshawana to that farm. We pulled in, I introduced myself, the, the carpenter in charge was out with the owner and told him how I knew about the barn raising. I said, would you mind if I come? He said, no, that'd be fine. So we drove back to her aunt's house that night and um, I slept like a kid waiting for Christmas. I couldn't wait for tomorrow. I got up early, fortunately they're an hour ahead, so it gave me a, a, a 
break on getting there. When I got there, they put me to work by taking a bucket of pegs, the wooden pegs that they put in the holes. They said, you can put them in the holes. Well, I thought, well, that's all right, until I saw that the kids were doing the same thing, and I had a whole lot more skill than that. Well, here comes a buggy in the lane, and who is it but um, David. <laughs> I could only think of P, his middle name. David P. Yoder. And Glenn, you made it. Yes. I said, but I'm, I'm putting pegs in the, the holes. I can do better than that. He said, well, I have a, an extra nail, apron, and hammer. You can use that. So I went to work, and the first thing you know, the carpenter came up. And he said, do you like heights? I said, yeah. He said, do you want to go up in that top beam and help them work on the, the gable rafters? I said, I'd love it. And, oh, I was like a pig in mud. I cleaned that one up. But it was, it was great. I think it was the last one off the roof at the end of the day. I had so much fun. And that was what, what um, kind of inspired me, certainly, and at first, Nance, to come and move here. Now, when, you look, when we look back at it, and we, if we had gone on Tuesday when we wanted to, David P. Yoder wouldn't have been working on those rickety ladders on his house. He'd have been at the barn raising. We would have never saw him, gone to the flea market, gone back to Nancy, Nancy's aunt, and gone back to New Jersey, never knowing about how great life is here in, in Indiana. But instead, two years later, we moved here and we love it here. But that was God's hand. God had in his plan for us to live here and that's how it would happen. So that was the next miracle in my life. And then we're going we're gonna to fast forward to, to 2018. In May of 2018, I was working with a neurologist who was trying to solve the problems that I have with getting headaches all the time. I've had headaches since fourth grade. I don't think rheumatic fever had anything to do with it, but I can remember in fourth grade having headaches. Well, this neurologist narrowed it down to the muscles in the back of my neck were the problem. And so he was giving me muscle relaxing shots in my neck. And I don't know why, but he, he finally decided to have an x-ray done of my neck. And when he did, he called me in for an appointment, and he said, Glenn, you need to go see Dr. Keogh in the oncology at the cancer center. He didn't explain what was what. He just said, that's what you need to do. And because what he saw in that x-ray sent me to the, the cancer center. And that was the very end of May, right before the... the um, the holiday of Memorial Day weekend was the following Monday. So that was Thursday, I think. On Friday, I had blood work done. And on Tuesday, I had a PET scan done. And in the afternoon, Dr. Keogh, on, tu on Tuesday, in the afternoon already, Dr. Keogh called me. He said, Glenn, your PSA is 886. And he said normal PSA is zero to four for a healthy male. And he said the PET scan has shown that you have cancer and it has spread to different parts of your body, to your hips, to your shoulders, to uh, some lymph nodes. And I think that's as much as he told me. He said, you need to come in tomorrow. We need to do work. And so Nance and I met with him the next day. And um, three weeks from that day, we were planning to go on my next trip to the Dominican Republic. And he came into the room and he opened up his computer to show us the PET scan. And it was just full of these black marks all over the place. And I thought, oh man, between 
what it looks like there in my PSA, I'm, I'm dead. I don't have much chance to live. And um, his phone rang. And he grabbed his phone and he answered it. He said, I, I've got to take this call. A colleague of mine just been diagnosed with cancer. I need to talk with him for a minute. Went out of the room and he left Nancy and I looking at that picture that just scared the daylights out of me for sure. Then he came back in the room and he said, a PET scan shows um, all this extra activity that's going on that's not normal. Well, well that, that, that's, some of it's normal, but it, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of energy that's going on. He said, well, for instance, right there, that's your heart. So that's got a lot of energy. This, that's your heart's fine. Over here was, I forget what. But he slowly took off all the black marks that looked like I had cancer everywhere, but narrowed it down to where the cancer was. A big tumor in my hip here, smaller one here, both shoulders. I ended up finding out much later that I had it in my skull, my spine, and some ribs, and some lymph nodes in my back. He said, we're going to start you on a new treatment that was just okayed by the um, medical whatever, the country here, three months ago before your cancer was diagnosed. And it's a hormone, inject hormone treatment, and you'll be going on hormone injections every six months, and you'll be taking these hormone pills, which was the new um, medication that was just approved. I had my first shot. Well, let me back up. Before he explained a lot of that, I said to him, what is this going to do to our trip that we have planned for the Dominican Republic? And he said, oh, what's that? And I explained to him. He said, well, just hold one second. He got on his phone, and he called his nurse and just rattled off this list of tests and this and that. And he said, ASAP. And he got off the phone and said, we're going to get you to the Dominican Republic. But you're going to have to go through a lot of tests in the next few weeks, which I did. They poked and probed and x-rayed and you name it, CAT scan. And on the Thursday before the Saturday we were leaving, I got the OK to go. Now, that was a miracle from God. He could have, the doctor could have said, I'm sorry, you, you can't go. And I, I did not want to miss that trip. He just said you couldn't work. That part I didn't like because I love to work. You have to supervise this thing. But nevertheless, I had my first shot in June, just before we left. And in July, I went in for my next bone density shot. I was receiving a bone density shot once a month because the cancer eats away at your bones. And the nurse practitioner, when, I, when she came into the office, she said, Glenn, I have good news and I have bad news. Which one do you want first? I said, I'll give me the bad news first. She said, well, I can't give you your bone density shot this morning because your calcium numbers are too low. I said, that's not so bad. I don't have to be poked today. What's the good news? He said, I think you're going to like the good news. He said, your PSA dropped to 7.43. I asked her three times, are you sure? Seven point, I knew it was 886 in May. Dropped to a single digit just above what normal is. I thought they had somebody else's blood. How could that be? And on the third time when she said yes, I just broke down like a baby crying. I could not believe it. She said, here, let me show you. And she showed me the paper. And May's numbers were there, 886. June's number was there at 932. It had gone up. And in July, it was down to 7.43. I said to her, do you expect that much of a drop with this new medication? She said, we expect a fairly good drop, but nothing like that. She said, this was a miracle. And I said, yes. That was the next miracle in my journey in cancer. My PSA has continued to drop and has, find, has reached for the last little over two years now. It is less than 0 0.07, which they call undetectable. 
and which also means the majority of the cancer in my body is dead. There's, the doctor said there will always be a small amount of cancer, of the of prostate cancer, but the majority of it is dead, which, again, a miracle of God. As much as it spread, I asked my, I asked Dr. Keo, how long do you think I had this cancer? If it spread so much and my PSA was so high, he said, oh, Glenn, you've had it for at least 10 years. And here I am, three years later, walking around almost, almost cancer free. But in the meantime, I had to deal with the side effects of the treatment. Now, prostate cancer feeds on testosterone. And um, testosterone, I think most of you understand, is an important part of intimacy with your wife. And it, in a month's time, it took my intimacy with Nancy away. And that was the thing that really drove me to depression. I didn't really worry about the cancer. I don't know why, even when my PSA was 886. I, I, I can't remember being that worried about the cancer. But when that was, was, the door was shut on that, that began my, my journey, which I'm still on, of depression. And I'm working right now with two counselors, one at the hospital and one at Oak Lawn. Both of them are Christian people. And that's a gift from God. I could have had two people that could care less about God. But both of them pray with me and allow me to pray with them. And um, it, it is a blessing. In fact, my, my uh, counselor from Oak Lawn really wanted to be here this morning. But he asked about with COVID and how we are with, with our restrictions. He's in his 80s and his doctor has instructed him that he has to be careful. And his wife is really um, making sure that he's careful. And when I told him that where, where masks were, were um, optional, he said, well, I really don't think I can make it. But he, he hopes to be, uh, is this gonna be recorded and then put on our website? Ken, good morning. He'll be watching it on, on our video. So I, I'm really excited about that. Um, God is miraculous. God is awesome. The things that have happened to me in the last three years, the good and the bad, God has carried me through the depression. I'm, I'm at a point right now where I have two, two surgeries scheduled in the next month and a half that hopefully will correct some of the problems of intimacy. And if it does, I'm beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel, which I didn't think I was going to see ever again. And that's God. That is God. That's God's hand through the hands of the doctors that will do the surgeries that will be done to give them the knowledge to do what they're going to do. They didn't know it on their own. God had to give it to them. And that's a miracle. It's a miracle from God. Now, that's just my story. But I guarantee you that each one of you have your story. Nancy has her story with her cancer where she was working in our garden in the spring, and she hit the back of her hand on our mailbox post. And it bruised her hand, but she didn't think anything much of it. It was just a bruise, but it didn't go away, and it didn't go away. So she went to the um, care. OK, she went to the doctor. It was x-rayed. And they saw what they call shadows in the bones in her wrist. They said, you need to go to, the, to your family doctor. He, in turn, said, you need to go to the cancer center. We met with 
a cancer doctor. I don't remember his name. She, we both now have the same cancer doctor, Dr. Dr. Pio. And, um, but he said to her, to us, that that was the er one of the earliest um, diagnosis of that cancer that he's ever had. And it all happened because God caused her to hit her hand on our mailbox post. If she hadn't done that, that cancer would have continued to spread. And he said it would have been a couple of years, three or four years before the symptoms would finally show up. And at that time, it would be so severe that it probably would not have been treatable. And here she is today, seven years, six years, almost seven years later, praise God that he caused her to hit her hand and it was diagnosed early. Um, I wouldn't have her here today probably. I don't know what I would do. But as I say, I know each one of you have a story. And I get a bird watching magazine that has an individual who writes stories every month about birds and, and humorous things. And we, I, my friend and I got to meet him at a, at a conference last year. And he's a, he's a funny guy. He is, he is just, his stories are just hilarious, but good. And he talked at one of the seminars about telling stories. And he said, every one of you have a story. But if you don't tell your story, no one will know. And especially stories like what I told the story this morning about my story and Nancy's story. That's just a small part of her story. Um, no one would know. And especially family. Um, my grandkids up there don't know half of what I told them this morning. Um, they need to know. You need to, your family has to know those stories so that they can, they can take them with them and pass them on to the next generation. And what it's, the bottom line is, is not what I did. It's what God did. And that's what we need to always bring out in our stories. It's not what we do, it's what God does through us. So that's my, that's my sermon to you this morning. My story was one thing, my, my sermon is tell your story and tell it that God has done it for you. Standing stones are kind of part of what that is um, story. This shirt I have to tell you, this is the final story. This shirt is a standing stone. I wore it the next week, and we were coming. I don't remember who I was with. But what were, was it with you, Nance? We were coming home from Grand Rapids or, or somewhere north. It was with Merlin, my birding friend. And we stopped in where US 12 crosses 31. There's a McDonald's there. We stopped there for lunch. And we're waiting in line, and I'm waiting in line, and a guy behind me taps me on my shoulder. He says, we were studying that, that verse all this past weekend. He had been to a Bible conference with a whole bunch of his men friends. And he said, that's a great verse. Now, if I didn't have this shirt on, I'd have got my French fries in Hamburg and got on. But here, I got to tell my story. I got to tell him what it was all about. It's not just a Bible verse. It's a verse that God gave to me to help me through my cancer. So I think that is just a neat thing. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are indeed awesome. Lord, um, a good meal may be great. A car may be good looking. Um, somebody's front lawn may be just as green as green can be. None of that's awesome, Lord. It's those pictures we showed this morning on the screen of your creation. Those things are awesome. 
We couldn't do that. I couldn't begin to speak words and have a moth that is snow white with purple edgings on its wings. I couldn't speak a word and, and, um, and had that purple gallinule, which was just painted so beautifully you, by you, Lord. Um, I, I can just see you at your, at your drawing board prior to creation and saying, we need a bird with a lot of color. Let's make the purple gallinule. And we have it to, to just stand in awe of today. But Lord, more important than anything else, we stand in awe of your son, Jesus Christ, who came into this world to live as we live, to experience Satan and his temptations as we experience, to offer his life on the cross, to pay our debt, so that we do not have to receive the penalty for sin. Lord, in your eyes, we are righteous. We are clean. Our sins are wiped away. You remember them no more. How awesome is that? And Lord, we look forward to the day, that awesome day that we get to say thank you to you in person and be reunited with so many family and friends. And besides that, so many people we've never met in our lives, including those, those uh, individuals who you've given to us in your word. Lord, I, I can't wait to meet Noah and ask him how he did it. Um, it it just amazes me as a carpenter. Lord, you're awesome, and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
sent us on our way with the parting blessing that he gave to Moses and he gave to Aaron and gave to Israel. And God said, May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God, face, may God turn his face towards you and keep you in his peace. Amen. Thank you all. Look at that. This is awesome. Thank you. Thank you.